This is the Real Estate Investing 365 Podcast, your go-to source for real estate investing strategies so you can start living the life you want and get where you want to go with your host, Justin Hanna. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Investing 365 Podcast. I have an amazing guest today. His name is Diego Corzo. He is from Austin, Texas. He has a great story. If you guys haven't heard, I'm sure we'll touch on it here in the interview. But he ha- he's been on the TED uh, TED Talk. Uh, he has a real estate team, an investment portfolio. Um, he's just doing killer things down there in Texas. So, what's up, Diego? Thanks for being on. What's up, Justin? Very happy to be here. All right, cool. So. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, I'm sure a lot of people already know who you are because you're making big waves all over the place, but give us a little history of Diego and, uh, why you're on our podcast. Yeah. So let me take you back and I'm going to be sharing here. I'm going to be sharing like personal stuff. So it's going to be good. Um, so I am what Congress calls a dreamer. And if people have been following the news, I am a DACA recipient, which basically means, um, so I was brought here to the United States when I was nine years old with, I came here with my parents and my brother. We came here with a visa legally, and then we decided to overstay. What that means is that I am an undocumented immigrant and it didn't really hit me until I turned 16 years old when all of my friends were getting their driver's license. I, uh, at that point, that's when I knew that my life was going to be a little bit different. And after that, I was able to graduate from high school, third in my class, got into college. It, it was sort of like the next thing to do for me. And, um, and that's when I found out as I was applying to universities and applying for financial aid, grants, scholarships, I found out that I couldn't qualify because they were asking for my green card or my citizenship. I managed to get into college. I, I got into FSU. And as I am trying to find work, I volunteer at this nonprofit and they want to hire me as I'm going through the process. They also tell me that because of the lack of my work authorization, I couldn't work. So I'm like 19 years old. At this point, I'm like, what the heck? I cannot drive. I cannot get student loans. I cannot drive. Um, And now I can't even work. So I ran into all these obstacles, but I still managed somehow to pull through. And then my senior year, um, well, what I did was I I created an an LLC. And by creating an, an LLC, it allowed me to get paid through that as a contractor. And I, been, and I began working for nonprofits and small businesses. In 2012, Obama passes the executive action called DACA, and that allows me to get, um, to get a job, to get my work authorization and, and a driver's license. So that's what happened. I was 22 years old. And like at that point, I felt like, the plates were even now between me and my friends. Um, And that's when I moved to Austin because I got a job as a software developer. Now, when I was 21 years old, this was while I was still in high school, my best friend throws me a book and it's called Rich Dad Poor Dad. And I read it and that book just changed my life because it taught me two things that you can either trade your time for money, right? Make active income or um, make your money work for you and make passive income. And so that was ingraining me a little bit and I just got hungry and I knew that at some point, no matter what kind of obstacles I had, I knew that I had to, I had the tools being in this country to build wealth. And for me, it was like, despite the obstacles, despite the challenges, I managed to keep a positive, uh, a positive mindset in figuring out that that the U.S. is a land of opportunity and that there's always a way. So that, that's what got me into move to Austin, work as a software developer. But at some point, I knew that I was going to start investing in real estate and um, became a realtor part-time. Now I'm a realtor full-time. And just to fast forward to where I am now, um, I own um, 
12 rental properties for a total of 18 doors. Some are here in Austin. I started by house hacking. Uh, some are Airbnbs in Tennessee and other ones are long-term investments in Jacksonville and in Bradenton, Florida. All right. That's a, a great story. And, and again, we'll link to it in the show notes, in, excuse me, in the show notes, but um, your story gets in depth in your TED talk and it's, it's a great um, a great story. So if you go to diegocorzo.com, I've been there a couple of times, you can check out his, <laughs> his TED talk story. So, all right, cool. So you're an immigrant, you come here, you guys move to Florida, <clears throat> you um, end up getting into college by the skin of your teeth and really working your butt off. You get in there, you graduate from college, you do great. But while you're in college, your friend gives you a rich dad, poor dad book. And mm -hmm. that just opened your eyes. And I, that's really the story for um, a, a lot of investors, right? I mean, that, that's what happened to me. I didn't know anybody really in, investing either. And I don't even know how I got the book, but I did. And it changed my life as well. So, well, that that's awesome. So now you're a full-time agent, but when you mm -hmm. got started, you were just doing it part-time? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was, I always had that mindset that, I, I just felt capped. So I was a software developer for General Motors and I was making a salary. And I was like, man, no matter how much, how many hours I can work, because I have a, I would say a good work ethic, um, no matter how many hours I would work, I wasn't going to make any more money unless I got a promotion or a bonus or something. So I decided to do something part time so that into something that wasn't capped. And because I wanted to build wealth in real estate sooner or later, I figured I don't know the market, but one way to learn is if I get my real estate license and I get my feet wet, I can talk to people, talk to investors and just and drive around Austin, show some homes and get to know the market. And um, that's, that's how it started. I was 23 years old when I got my license. Okay. So you got your license before you bought your first property? Yes. Yes, I did. Okay. okay. Yeah. And so that's awesome. And that is really a thing that a lot of real estate investors have in common is a lot of them, including myself and you and David Green on the Bigger Pocket show. And they, they realize that when they're working for a major corporation or a big, you know, government agency or something, you know, you're, you're always going to be capped and you're, you're always going to be an hourly employee. You know what I mean? Which is not a bad thing if that's the route you want to go. But one thing it seems we all have in common is um, we want to grow that hourly number. And there's probably not too many companies that are going to pay you a thousand or five or ten thousand dollars an hour to do their work, you know. Um, and you're the type of person, even if somebody was going to pay you five thousand dollars an hour, I'm sure you would still probably eventually quit and go out because you want to have bigger dreams and you want to make succeed on your own, right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I want to put that like, I like it when, when it's on me. Yeah, definitely. Okay. That's great. So tell me about your first rental property. You get your license, you're a part-time agent, you're working at General Motors as a software developer and you're mm -hmm. looking for your first property. How'd that go down? Yeah. So my first rental, um, or my, my first property overall, it's a little bit unique because so I, what I wanted to do, the, the plan for my first property was to buy a three or four bedroom property that I could live there, right? Rent out the rooms while I had, while I lived on the master, basically house hack. But the issue that I ran into was that no lender, there wasn't any lender that knew what the DACA program was, what it meant to have a C33 on your work authorization and all this other stuff. So a lot of the lenders, they were like, we cannot help you get a loan. So I called my dad and I was like, dad, like, what the heck? I'm trying to build wealth. I'm trying to get started into this that I know um, it's a great opportunity, but I can't. I can't get any loans. So he tells me, well, why don't we buy a property cash here in Florida? I'll manage it and we can go in 50-50. I was like, cool. So we bought a property. It was 65K in Bradenton, Florida. Um, I had 25K. My dad had 25K and we borrowed 10K from my friend. And uh, that, that's how I bought that property. 
So it rented out um, for, I believe it was 1100 in the beginning. Um, and it was, it has worked out ever since. So, <clears throat> so, so yeah, that was in October, October, 2013. I was, uh, I wanted to get it before I turned 23, but it just didn't happen. Uh, but that gave me the opportunity to start investing and, and it went from, from there. And it wasn't until later the next year that I was able to finally find a lender that could give me a, a loan with DACA and I was able to house hack. Okay, sweet. So you got it for 60 grand. It was listed 65, for 65,000 and you were able to rent out for 1100 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. That's like a 2% rule they talk about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is back in like 2013, right? So like things are awesome back then. I wish that I, I wish I, number one, I wish I had more cash back then, but I was 23. And then number two, like, I just wish I invested more and didn't think about it as much. Yeah. Don't we all, man, I'm the same way. I'm like, man, I was working in the Bay area in 2009, 10, 11. And I was like, I should have bought everything, everything there was in sight. But I was young. I was 20, 19, 20. I didn't know anything. <laughs> so, yeah. okay. So um, I was going to ask you about the financing, but you guys ended up paying cash. And so that's one thing you, you said there is that you, you couldn't find a lender because of your DACA situation. And so mm -hmm. a lot of people, you know, they don't buy, they don't ever buy their first deal because they can't figure out the first step and they don't know what, Oh, well, I don't make enough money or I can't get financing and I got bad credit. You didn't even have a citizenship and nobody even knew what your, um, your DACA program meant. So nobody would lend to you and you still were able to figure it out. You had worked your butt off. You saved up the money. Your dad had some money. You said, Hey, let's figure this out. So you were able to find a property. So congratulations on that. Good job. And, uh, thank you. So how did you end up finding the deal? Did you work with a realtor there or did you know somebody? My dad just happened to, I think he knew somebody. Um, and I think he used a realtor over there to help like to show him the property, to write the contract and everything. Yeah. Okay. So you kind of relied on your dad being back there and back home to uh, find the property and look at the properties and decide this is the one that we're going to use. Yeah, I sort of, yeah. So I, at that point, I, I just had to put like all, all of my trust in him because I bought the property on my end. I was in Austin and I, I never saw the property. I never, like I just wired the 25K and then uh, I saw the property like a year later or something. Okay. All right, cool. So, yeah. um, and I guess management, you said your dad was going to manage the property. So is that what you guys ended up doing? Yeah. That's exactly what happened. He, he, he found a tenant and then, um, and then it, it was a small family. So it worked out really well. Okay. And had your dad had any other experience in uh, rental properties at the time either? So funny story. So when I re remember I told you when I read Rich That Poor that I was 21. So that was 2011. Uh -huh. I called my dad randomly. I'm like, hey, dad, like, so my parents own two Peruvian restaurants in Sarasota and Bradenton. And um, I call him and I'm like, I just read in this book that instead of somebody buying a car for 20K, you can buy a condo for 20K, have that income that's coming in to cover the car payment. And then once the car is paid off, you still have income from that condo. And my dad was like, wow, that's pretty smart. So a week later, he calls me and he says, Diego, I found a condo for 21K around the neighborhood. Should I buy it? I was like, I don't know. I mean, sure. So he bought it. And, um, and yeah, we, we still ha he still has that property because that, that's his. But since then, now he also has a portfolio of, I think, like now, like around 16 doors or 20 doors. But it's crazy how it all started from me reading Rich That Poor that, I gave him that example and then he went and bought a property. That's so that's awesome. Cool. So, then, yeah. so he ended up managing your property and he's like, this is amazing. Just like you thought so. And, and he kept buying more property. Maybe, yeah. maybe I should have your dad on the podcast too. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So what are some mistakes? Was there any mistakes that you guys made in buying that property or in managing it that you know of that you can kind of uh, shed some light on? Um, so that's a property I would say years later, years later, um, like this, like about a month and a half, actually, um, we had to go through our first eviction in that, in that area. Um, and what happened was the tenant moved out. I mean, I'm sorry, the tenant left, but she left her two cousins in there and we had no idea. Um, and then she, somehow they were paying it. And it wasn't until later that we found out that the two cousins were there. But then what happened was they became squatters because we really didn't like she, because they weren't on the lease. They were just there at the house and she had already left. Um, yeah. So we had to evict them. We went through the eviction process of getting the cops and all of that stuff. Uh, and then now, my dad is in the process of getting contractors there and stuff so that we can remodel the property again. Okay. But you had a nice long several, I mean, since so five years you had pretty much. Um, yeah. Trouble yeah. Yeah. Free. Yeah. We, we didn't, we didn't make, I think we didn't make like any particular mistakes on that. Um, now the property, for example, like as is, is worth around a hundred thousand, um, which is really cool considering that we bought it, for 65 yeah. and we didn't really put much into it. Right. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. That's a great time. Great time to buy. <clears throat> okay, cool. Well, let's jump ahead. So you touched on it in your intro, but now what does your current portfolio look like um, with your rental properties? Yeah. So my portfolio right now consists of um, two properties that I'm house hacking here in Austin. Um, it includes another Airbnb condo that I have in Austin, five doors in Tennessee in the Smoky Mountains. And then, um, oh, that, that's where I do Airbnb. And then the long-term homes in Jacksonville, Florida, um, that those are more long-term and stuff like that. But in the future, I'm going to get rid of them and start investing into some other kind of like bigger multifamilies or syndications or something like that. I haven't done any research on that yet, but I know that that's where I'm going. Okay. So you said you're house hacking two properties. How do you house, house, house hack two properties? Yeah. So basically, so um, in 2014, I bought, I bought my first property to house hack. Um, it was 170 here in Austin. I lived in the master, rented out the three rooms. Now, um, I used, uh, by this time, I did find a lender and he was able to give me a conventional loan, putting 5% down. By this time too, I was a realtor. So I was able to use part of my commission um, or at least I made money from it, right? So um, at that point, even though I put the 5% down after the closing, I got the 3% that was part of my commission, but I was able to negotiate the seller to pay for half of my closing costs too. And I moved into the property. I found tenants through Craigslist. And by the day that I moved into it, that's when my tenants moved in as well. Um, which was great because it allowed me to be making money from day one. The cool part too was that I was renting each room back then for five fifty for a total of thirteen of uh, for a total of sixteen fifty, and my mortgage was thirteen fifty. So while I was living in the master bedroom, I was making three hundred dollars extra for like other expenses. Right? It paid off. It it paid off itself, and the three hundred dollars also covered my car payment. So, and because of the fact that I couldn't get into any student loans or anything like that from college, um, I, since the age of 24, I live for free. My car payment has been covered by other people, my housing as well. And I didn't have much credit card debt. So I've been living for free ever since then. And it's been, it's been amazing. That's cool. And then, so you have another house that you did the same thing on. So, you, so what you, yeah, so yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so then what, what happened was I moved, I moved out of that house. I put somebody in the master 
And then I did that same thing in another house. The great part about it was that instead of kicking all the roommates out or moving my roommates to my new house, um, I was going to be able to cash flow a lot more from that property by putting in the roommates there. Because imagine like sixteen fifty, let's say, um, plus seven hundred that I was able to rent out the rooms. It was like two thousand dollars or more. Um, yeah, it was like twenty two hundred, um, and my mortgage was thirteen fifty, right? So I was like cash flowing like eight hundred dollars. Where if I had put a family in there, I would have only cash flow like two hundred bucks. Right. So that's a real important thing to think of is like creative. So, you know, creative ways of renting out your properties. Um, I know that people in the Bay area or in Denver or these really hot markets, you know, a lot of them talk about, they're not able to, um, well, it doesn't make sense to buy the property cause they're so expensive and I can't rent it from what my mortgage is. Well, no, maybe you can't for one family, like you're saying, but if you're able to do it in a way where you, rent out the per room, well, then you can get a lot more uh, bang for your buck, right? Is that, that's what you're saying. Exactly, exactly. And at the end of the day, like, I'm young, so I can still work a little bit for it, right? It's like passive income, but I'm still working for it. But it's still pretty cool to, like, just be on my phone, and on the first of the month, I get Venmo pings, like, that they've paid me, right? And that's really cool. That's yeah, we, really cool. we like that for sure. Um, so do you manage these properties in Austin? yourself? The ones in Austin, the ones that I'm renting by the rooms. Yeah. Okay. And then I'm sure you found those by, um, because you're a realtor there. So you're hot on the market. Yeah. So the, the houses, I was able to find them, um, on the MLS. And then the one that I currently like my, my last house hack, I bought it from, from, from a builder. I'm a big proponent, like not so a lot of people want to buy a home and then, but they get scared because I'm like, oh, I cannot remodel. I don't want to change the carpet. I don't want to change the kitchen or whatever. Both of my homes were remodeled. Like my first one was completely remodeled and the other one is brand new. I'm not really handy. And I'm like, I just want to get money from day one. A lot of people will wait two months or three months to remodel the house and then get roommates. With doing this, it allows me to just make money from day one. And by working with the builder, um, it was DR Horton. Um, I went with that lender and they were able to pay for all my closing costs. And if you time it right, and I don't know, but sometimes it, it just happens for me, the builders have to hit a quota number every quarter. And every builder has a different fiscal year or how it, like their calendar year is a little bit different. So some months they will, they will be okay dropping the price by 15 K or 20 K on, on, on a home because they really need to hit that number. So when I bought it, they gave me extra incentive on the realtor commission and this and that. So it worked out great. All right. Yeah, that's cool. And that's a, those are, that's a, there's multiple strategies, right? There's a thousand ways to do everything. And so I, I do like what you're saying that you don't, you know, you'd rather buy a house. that's going to have low capital expenses. You're going to have low maintenance expenses. It's a newer house or completely remodeled. So you don't have to worry about all that overhead that if you're buying a C class property or C minus property, you're going to worry about the HVAC going out or the roof leaking or the water heater or something. And those expenses can add up quickly. And for a new investor, you know, you might not know how to do the due diligence or set aside money as well as, an experienced one. So that's a great, great strategy. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then what I just did is I, I basically, I kept the same lifestyle as I was buying my properties. So a lot of people were thinking, Diego, like why? Cause I was making good money. Right. And then, um, at GM and I, w I had some money from, from my real estate as a realtor, but I was still living with roommates. And they were like, why are you still doing that? And it was, it's because like I, in the, like, I think that life is a marathon, not a, not a sprint. And I'm just trying to build right now a portfolio so that my passive income can, can cover all of my expenses, right? So that I can become financially independent. And that for me was a lot more important than living a really cool lifestyle. 
And that is what I think has set, set me apart um, from, from other people too, that I just manage my finances in a way that allows me to still enjoy experiences, but I'm not buying a new car every two years. I'm not getting the iPhone, the new iPhone every time one comes out, stuff like that. That's so, I, I love that. And I was actually, I have a whole page of notes on my phone that I was writing today because I was thinking about a podcast I'm going to do in the future, talking specifically about that. You have, you know, I won't go too in depth, but just like you're saying, there's people out there that they might be making 50 grand a year, 60 grand a year, but they're driving a $60,000 truck and they got a $2,500 a month mortgage. And it's like, man, that's cool if that's what you want. But if you really want to get ahead, you need to like, buckle down and keep your expenses low, just like you did. So that's, yeah. that's uh, smart. And the, the quote that helped me came from a guy named Adam Carroll. And he said, build a bigger life, not a bigger lifestyle. And that always like, that's st- st- stuck with me. And, um, and that's why I live the way I live. Okay. That's awesome. Good job. So I, I really like that. Um, I want to touch on your properties in Tennessee because we, you know, we've talked about on this podcast several times, you know, the, the, the house hacking and this um, just single family rentals or small multifamily, but we haven't touched too much on Airbnb properties. So t- talk to me about those out there in Tennessee. Yeah. Um, so interesting. Um, that portfolio, so a couple of years ago, I met an investor here in Austin. He bought two properties where I was his realtor. Um, and then he hits me up and he tells me, Diego, I've been buying some properties for Airbnb in the Smoky Mountains in the Valley Forge or Pigeon Forge area. Um, do you want to invest on in some of them? And I was like, sure. But I want to make sure that I cover like, so... With, with Airbnb, there is, there is something called a super host, which basically means that you can manage, like even though you, you have an account, you can still manage other properties. And the reviews that you get affect all of your other, affect all of your other homes too. So for me, that was sort of um, a little bit of like assurance that, hey, I'm going to be investing with him but in order for, for him to look good with all of his properties, the, all the reviews have to be good depending if it's just his property or the properties that we are investing on it together. So he was um, a super host? He was a super host back then, yeah. Okay. And um, so I became more of like a silent partner from the perspective that he would send me the deals, um, we will partner up with him and I became the money guy. And he took care of all of the systems, he took care of finding the cleaners, the property man, the person. Well, so he's the manager of it, but, um, but he has a lot of things in place. So I wouldn't be the best person to like break everything down. What I just did is, so there's like four, five bedroom cabins that fit like two, three, four different families. The approach that I took, because I don't know that market well, and I'm a big believer in like, in the beginning, try to not be as risky from, from, from that perspective in a way that you can still take action, right? Because I'm, I'm a big proponent of taking action. But uh, what I did is I invested with my partner on studios, studio apartments or studio cabins or one bedroom apartments. And uh, that also simplifies it in a vacation rental where you're not dealing with one or two families that are complaining about things not going the well the, the way that they want it. It's more like a couple um, or maybe just one person and they go there to on a vacation. They're not going to spend most of their time in the apartment. So it just makes it super easy where they can just go there, have fun, like sleep, and then they're out hiking or skiing or doing whatever. Right. Make it more simple simpler. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And so we're how- buying them for like, we're buying, we, we bought, for example, a couple of studios for like 60 K 70 K. Um, now like a hundred K. Um, and then we bought a cabin. Uh, we, there were 
two cabins that were studios in one big lot. Um, and we bought each of them for 188, I believe. And we're about to refinance them right now. We're in the process as we speak, and we're hoping for it to refinance at around 300, like okay. the appraised value of 300,000. Right. Oh, so you're going to take some cash out of those properties. That's, yeah. that's a good chunk of change. So what do oh, those, yeah. what do those properties, you said you bought each of those, that's those specific ones, 188,000 each. Um, mm -hmm. How much do you guys make off of those properties every month? Man, all I know is that from that portfolio, I, I'm like making like 15, 1500 a month. So I don't, I don't know all of the, all of the, um, all of the numbers and stuff like that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so I wouldn't be the best person to tell you that right no, now. No, but that's pretty All good. All I know is that I'm making like 15, 1500 a month. But that's pretty good because you're splitting that with your partner and that's spread out over five properties. So you're probably making three grand a month over five properties. After expenses. Yeah. After expenses. So that's much more than if you were just renting them as um, a regular, you know, month to month rental property. I'm sure because, you know, five properties, somebody might be cash flowing, let's say 300 bucks a month. That's only fifteen hundred bucks. So you're really doubling your cash flow, it seems. Probably, yeah. especially especially because over there is like a solely vacation rental, right? It's not like not many people go there and be like, "I'm gonna, I'm going to like, like, not not many people rent there for years and years and years. They might be uh, six months, maybe a year, but most people are out there for vacation." So that's a, that's a great tip right there for people that are in small town or rural areas. And, you know, they think, well, I can't really buy cause you know, there's not a lot of renters here. Well, maybe you're in an area that people like to visit, you know? So the Airbnb thing, um, is a great Avenue. Now, now do you guys, you guys obviously, um, furnish the properties and does your partner there, um, does he clean them and maintenance them or does he have a maintenance staff that does them? Yeah. So basically what happens is when we buy the property, we take an interior designer as well. So we do the inspections, we do the diligence process. Um, but then we, we have the interior designer go out there and they make it look as nice as possible with pot. Cause those properties, um, most of the apartments have furniture already there. So what happens is the interior designer just goes there and spice things up um, unless we see that some things really need to get changed, right? But most of the time, the pictures, when we're looking at properties, the bed sheets, they look like it's like an old grandma kind of like bed sheets, where yeah. if we put a modern one, it already looks like 10 times better, right? Um, so we just make sure that we make it, we... We just make it so that the pictures just look amazing and it, it, it just looks more homey to today's standards for as a vacation rental, right? So yeah, it looks really cool because yeah. we, we have things that pop out. The like we sometimes there there is a theme within the property, within the condo. So we just put different things that make it look very cozy. Right. And it's, it's Smoky Mountain, Tennessee. So you probably make it a little mountain mountain theme or rustic or whatever to make it look cute and quaint or all that stuff. So yeah. Yeah. And then we have some cleaners in place that uh, we were actually working uh, for for a little while with like some kind of manager as well, that basically, as soon as a cleaner is in, as soon as somebody leaves and checks out, we have a cleaner that goes in that, that same bay and all of that stuff. So all of that is automated from, oh, from that perspective through a calendar that we have. Um, from my understanding, it's like a Google, it's a Google calendar that gets integrated with the cleaners so that they know as soon as somebody leaves, they know that that day by noon, they need to be in there and then they clean the whole, the whole place. Perfect. That's awesome. Cool. So yeah. you find these properties through a local agent up there? Yes. Okay. All right. And mm -hmm. then you guys are, how are you fu funding these deals? Is it still regular financing? 
Some have been conventional and then others have been, we just ask our friends and, um, and we've been giving them like one or two points and then 10%. Okay. Like a 10% return on their money yeah, for, over... for like a year or two years. Yeah. With a goal of later being able to refinance them. And that's what we're working on now because I started this last year. Um, uh, like a year and a half ago, a year ago. Yeah. A year ago. So do you guys, so do they own a percentage of interest in the property or do you just pay them that rate? Um, they have first lien in the property. Okay. All right, mm -hmm. cool. Well, that's great. So that sounds like it's, it's going fantastic for you. So keep buying more up in the smoky mountains, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we move on to our, our next little spot here, I wanted to touch base on the fact that you are a full-time um, realtor and you, you run a real estate team there in Austin. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of investors, new investors always think the question is whether they should get their real estate license or they shouldn't get their real estate license and what effects that has on their investing career. So can you maybe uh, broaden our horizons a little bit on that? And what do you think? Yeah. I I would recommend, and this is me as an agent here in Austin, I would recommend, or I would say, if you're buying just like one or two properties a year as an investor, I don't recommend getting yourself your license because of the expenses that it comes with it. Because to, to get your license, you have to pay like a thousand dollars for the classes and then you have to pay something for the exam and then you have to go through a background check and all this stuff. So by the time that you're that, that you get started, you're like two, 2000, um, in the red and then you have to get some knowledge. Like if you don't have any knowledge on the contracts or anything like that, and you're going to be buying your first property, you're probably going to make a couple of mistakes. And on the realtor side, which is a little bit more like if you can get help from a professional, I would say that that will be the best thing. Now, the reason why I got a license is because I wanted to do it part time. And the goal when I was doing it part time was to sell a house every two months. And that will get me to maybe like, for, for example, the first year that I did part time real estate, I think I made like 40K. Um, yeah, I pretty think good. that's how much, but it was pretty good. And then it allowed me the opportunity to, to be able to learn the market, right. But helping, but I was also helping other people. Um, so that's what I would say. Don't, don't just do it to buy one property a year. It is not going to be worth it. Right. Yeah. And I, I kind of tend to agree that if, you know, because of the MLS fees, ongoing quarterly fees and your licensing fees and all this stuff, then you have to find a broker to hang your license and yeah. <clears throat> they're going to take a percentage of your commission, whether it's your property or not, you know? So, um, yeah, if you're just doing, if you're, if you're thinking about getting your license strictly for buying your own rental property, if you're only going to buy one or two, like you said, maybe it's not worth it, but if you're going to get your license because you wanted it to start that as a part-time career or a full-time career, it definitely has its benefits in, um, learning the market, um, getting better at negotiating that type of thing, right. For buying your own properties. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. So how big is your real estate team? Is it just you or are you and a partner? Or? So it's me and my business partner. And then we have a full-time admin. And then sometimes we, we have other showing assistants, but the admin, um, he's basically our office manager. He's our transaction coordinator. He, he's the one that drops off the, like the checks, the lock boxes, he puts up the signs and, uh, it's been going really well the way that we've been able to systemize this stuff, um, to the sense that a lot of the stuff that I'm just doing is just with a client and none of the paperwork. It didn't start that way at all but we've been able to put some systems in place reading the right books and just implementing stuff that makes things a lot better are you with uh, keller williams yes i am with keller williams okay they seem to have a really good training program mentorship program and really helping you build your business right 
They do. They do. And when you and when you combine that with the book, the the Emith, um, like that that book changed my mindset on a lot of stuff. So I was able to basically systemize and make checklists of all of the steps that I was doing as a realtor and being like, okay, this can be documented, this can be documented, this can be documented. Um, and then so I took the checklist when I was dealing with buyers, with sellers. I recorded my screen as I was doing those things if they had to be done in the computer. I hired somebody in the Philippines to basically to write all the steps down, um, like, a, like a documentation booklet. And then for 70 bucks, I, I mean, she, she did all of the steps. And then I gave that to the transaction coordinator with checklist and it went from there. It was freaking awesome. That is awesome. I'm gonna. I I I haven't got the E Myth yet, but I order new books like every other day on Amazon. It seems so. I'm gonna order that one tonight. Um, that's yeah. great. So, how many? Just for some uh, clarification, how many houses do you guys think do you sell a year with your team, you and your partner? We sell around sixty-five homes a year, sixty to eighty homes a year. Yeah, sixty-five to eighty for a total of seventeen to twenty million um in volume okay. and uh, the cool part is that we do it through referrals we haven't like at least there's a bunch of different ways that people get clients as realtors they tell them hey you can call call you can do a bunch of open houses you can go door knocking um i just work my sphere pretty well from the perspective that a lot of the things that i do Real estate sometimes comes in the conversation, and then when they're ready to buy, they ask me. So I don't spend any money in in like Facebook ads or marketing or anything like that. Um, it I've been really blessed to be able to um, to be very very um, like it just comes. It's some some somehow there's there's always leads that hit me up and stuff like that. And then now, as um, the more that I do this, of course, now I'm getting more referrals through, through, through other buyers, through other people, and even some realtors too that want to invest in Austin. Yeah, well, I mean, you say from your point of view, you might think that I don't know how it's happening. It's like magic. It just keeps coming. But it's not that, Diego. What it is is that you bust your ass and you're honest yeah. and you tell your clients how it is, like the truth, and you don't try to just make money. You're trying to actually help people. And when you actually try to help people, people want to help you back and they like to work with you. They refer you. And it's just, it's not magic. It's because you're a hard worker and you're making big things happen. So um, kudos to that. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So, so yeah, I just put myself, I'm pretty good and I don't know if it comes naturally or whatever, but I just put myself in situations where this stuff just like happens. Um, and then the conversations just like roll. Yeah. And, um, and it's been great. And I mean, I share on Facebook, right? I like, I, I share a little bit about my journey in real estate on Facebook and that gives me, um, so one one thing that happened was GM hired a bunch of people from college. And from my perspective, I was like, man, these people are renting for the first year in an apartment. Later, they might rent for the next year a house, and then they're going to buy. Um, or they go from an apartment to wanting to buy a house. So I began to teach a lot of them house hacking. I was like, hey, you can do this too. If you want to live in downtown Austin, you can do that, but do it later, not right now. Buy a house, live in it for a year, rent out the rooms, rent out the master once you're ready, and then go move downtown if you really want to. So I've been able to get a lot of people that were working at General Motors um, to be my clients. And it has been great when I've been helping like people buy their third house hack um, and then they're selling one, they're investing in another one. So it's really cool while they're still software developers. Cause I think that this house hacking is a, it's a great way for people to just get started while still having a job. Um, and then seeing where it goes from, from there. Now for people that are trying to transition from having a full-time job 
and doing real estate part time and want to go into real estate full time, if you are, if you're, if you want to invest, right, um, I would say maximize, maximize the good debt that you can get into before you quit. Because once you quit, full, then you cannot use your, your, like your 1099, you have to have two years of history. So if you quit, let's say in October of this year, your, your full-time job and you want to buy a house in January of next year, you're not going to be able to because now you have to wait your two years to be 1099. So that is what I would recommend. Right. So <clears throat> what you're saying is before somebody leaves, it's going to be much harder for them to get a loan when they leave and they're doing their own thing as an agent because they don't have a regular W-2 income. They're now a 1099 employee. So max out your uh, financing options before you leave. So when you do leave, you have a little gap that you're building up your revenue so you can get more loans. <clears throat> exactly. Okay, cool. So where are you going from here, Diego? I'm sure we're going to see you on uh, in Forbes list someday. So what's the, what's the plans in uh, real estate investing? You know, like what is your, do you, if you have a unit goal, what you're moving into, and then what's your plans for your real estate business to keep growing that or what's the deal? What, where are you going? Yeah. So fortunately, um, so my story as a dreamer and all this other stuff, it caught some kind of, so I, I've been featured on Forbes, CNN money. I've spoken in Congress. Um, I've shared my story on two TEDx stages and it's giving me a lot of credibility with a lot of the dreamers and the immigrants community, but also with a lot of millennials as the way that I've been investing. So I am working on launching a house hacking course coming up soon. Um, and that's going to get me the opportunity to be able to um, be able to help people that are not just in Austin, but I walk them through the entire process from finding your, from finding your team to finding the deal to making passive income. So walking them through it. The best thing about that is that whenever I'm sharing my story on a stage or something and people do want to learn from me, then that's when I, I can let them know, hey, you can, you, I can help you buy your first home through house hacking or whatever. And then due to the fact that I've been investing in mastermind groups and connecting myself with highly successful entrepreneurs... Mm -hmm. Um, I've been able to build great connections. So then what happens is I'm able to not just help somebody go through the course and walk them through it, but also recommend them an investor friendly realtor that I know is going to that I like that is not just going to be their first rodeo. I know that they've been doing it for a while, so they're going to do a great job. And from that perspective, it will help me build more of a referral based business not just here in Austin, but through other agents as well, with the goal of being location independent. Okay. Because so, that's what I want. So that's for your real estate business. You want to kind of move to not being dependent on just the Austin market. Exactly. Exactly. I want to be location independent. And then on the investing side, ideally, um, like I have a goal. Oh, so I have a goal of becoming a millionaire by 30. Um, that's a goal. And then ideally in the next coming years, I want to get my passive income to 10 K. I'm not there yet or anywhere near there. Like I'm, I'm a little bit less than 50% that 10 K mark, but it, it gives me something to strive for and to invest the right way. Okay, cool. Well, that's, uh, I think you'll meet that goal very quickly. I, I, I can't imagine you're too far off. And uh, I think you're going to have to 10x that rule. We're going to have to get, read that Grant Cardone 10x rule book. Right? Maximize yeah. those, blow them up, get, go for uh, <laughs> what, 100K a month in passive income, which I'm sure is down the road. Yeah. So, I mean, it's totally doable. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you like three, four years on the road. In the long term, I mean, I want to be a speaker. I want to be investing in syndications. Um, 
being able to do 1031 exchanges in, in, in the way that I'm building more of my wealth that, that way. Um, but I also have to understand that wealth is good, but cash flow gives you freedom, right? So that's, that's what I like. Yeah, me too, for sure. Cool. So, um, we'll move on to what is some resources. So by resources, I mean, what is the way that you like to learn more about real estate investing? Um, is it through books or courses, mentorships, podcasts? Um, what is your preferred method? So I'm a big proponent of listening to podcasts, right? There's a lot of personal development ed education, but I'm also a big proponent of connecting with the right people, changing your conversations, um, elevating your group, elevating your tribe. So a lot of the education that I get is just not from YouTube videos or whatever. It's more from me putting myself in situations where I'm meeting people that are doing what I want to do in five years or 10 years. And those are the people that elevate me. Um, so that is one of the best ways that I've been able to learn, um, just life overall. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's very good. And that's one thing, uh, a recurring theme is networking. You gotta, you gotta get out there. You gotta talk to more people and up your social influence, you know? So cool. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> what about a favorite app? Is there an app you use every day that is something that just makes your life way easier? Um, I've been using Trello lately to manage a couple of, a couple of my deals as, as a realtor. Um, and then I just look at that Trello cause like I'm not doing a huge amount of deals from the perspective that like, that, um, like there, there, there's other things that my, that my full-time admin does. But for me personally, I use Trello as the way to have like, these are all of my leads. These are the ones that I need to contact, which ones are active, pending, whatever. And that's been pretty cool. Okay, cool. Trello. Sweet. So what about a mindset tip? We all kind of get down and we all kind of get like off track and demotivated and kind of like get in a rut sometimes. What is something that you do to get yourself out of the rut and say, come on, Diego, get your ass in gear and make, start making it happen again. Yeah. Um, a mindset tip that will get you to get, I would say people like within real estate, within whatever they need to have a strong enough. Why? If they don't have a strong enough, why they are going to quit. So for example, the why for me is my family. They went through a lot of sacrifices, had to learn a new language and all this other stuff um, to be able to get me to where, to where I am today. And now my goal is to make, like to show them that it was totally worth it. And um, if you have a strong enough why, then no matter what obstacle will happen, because Real estate is not, it's not easy. There's always different obstacles. And like my life has been still till now is always up and down with so many obstacles of my immigration and whatever. But by having the mindset, right? And this is something that I said in my TED talk, but like I have the mindset that if the door of opportunity is closed, I go through the window. And that's because I know that the US is a land of opportunity, but it is up to us to find it. And it is up to us to, understand that there is a solution out there for us. We just have to work hard for it. And a lot of people are not willing to sacrifice a little bit in the short term for the long term. Awesome. So when you get down, you just remind yourself, listen, that my remind yourself of your why and uh, that you know it's going to be all worth it in the end. Exactly. <clears throat> Awesome. Okay. So what would be a, your number one tip for a new investor and number one tip for an aspiring real estate agent? Yeah. For a new investor, I would say don't focus on, on getting to your first home run or to get into a home run in your first try. Just try to get to first base. Because if you try to get a home run, you're going to have analysis paralysis. But if you get to first base, you're going to learn, you're going to set up your team, you're probably going to make some systems and put them in place so that it can make it a lot easier for the second, third, fourth, and then you can hit your home run. And then for the agent, 
I would say shadow somebody that that is where you want to be in a couple of years. That's what happened with me. Um, I basically, I offered, when I wanted to buy my first house in Austin, um, I used a realtor because I didn't have my, my realtor's license back then. Um, and we, we became friends, but in, when I wanted to get my license, when I was asking him about it, I asked him if I could drive him around for a few weekends, uh, for free to see if I would like it. And so I shadowed him for two or three weekends. He got value out of it because he was getting a free driver. And then, um, and then I got value from it because I was able to, to shadow him. And then years later, he's now my business partner and it has been amazing. Right. But I started by work to learn sort of mentality I gave him I, the value of my time in the beginning because I had a lot. Um, and um, and I, w- I would say that that's one of the best ways to start as, as a realtor because you get to see their, their deals, right? If I was just starting as an agent on my own um, without his mentorship, now it all, it all depends where you are in life and all this other stuff. But for me, I was able to see in two years or three years, I've been able to have experience of over 200 deals um, just by working with him in a sense that I've seen so many different deals, so much crap, so much good stuff that, that has given me the opportunity and the experience that I have today. Awesome. Okay. Um, And then one more motivational influencer, like somebody like a social media, somebody that's out there that you really admire and you like to follow and take advice from. Yeah. One of them, his name is Matt Aitchison and he's from, uh, he has the podcast Millionaire Mindcast or Millionaire Mindset. And um, Matt A, he is an amazing human being. He's been a mentor, a friend, and his podcast just ranked like top 11 of entrepreneurship on, uh, on iTunes. Yeah, okay. he also has a planner. He has a flipping course and all this other stuff. And he is, uh, he's the real deal. Like he, he walks the talk and everything. Okay, what was his name? Matt what? Matt Aitchison. Aitchison, okay. Yeah. All right, cool. So any last comments or last thoughts or final words um, for new investors? Yeah, I would say um, trust the process. And as I mentioned earlier, life is a marathon, not a sprint. Don't have the crock, like don't have the microwave mentality, but rather have the crock pot mentality because mistakes will happen. But if you know that it's only a little chunk of a huge long race, then it's not going to matter. Right on. So where can people find out more about Diego? Yeah, they can check out diegocorso.com or if they want to learn more about house hacking, they can go to househackingclub.com and they can send me an email to info at diegocorso.com. Okay. And your real estate team is what, and how, you know, if we have some age or people looking for houses in Austin, they should contact you where? Yeah. Um, they can send me an email too. I'll be more, more than happy. I mean, the, the website, the website that we use is Victor Nino.com. But b- basically if they go to Diego Corso.com, they'll be able to connect with me. All right. Well, Diego, this was an awesome podcast. I could seriously sit here and pick your brain for hours. Um, I appreciate you being on and uh, I'm sure we'll hear more from you in the future. And I look forward to talking to you again. For sure, bro. It has been a pleasure. All right. Thank you. Have a good night, Diego. Bye-bye. Bye.